to um, introduce Dr. Tommy Cairns, who's got a great program for us tonight. Um, we don't know what it's going to be, but I know it's going to be great. <laughs> he really doesn't need an introduction. Uh, he's an internationally renowned rose expert exhibitor. He's a top authority on all aspects of growing roses, holding and judging credentials both in the Royal National Rose Society of Great Britain, the American Rose Society, and the World and I could go on and on and on. And uh, Tommy, are you going to have to Yes, I am. Okay. Uh, I will turn the microphone over to Tommy Carey. Dr. In true Hollywood fashion, here we go.
Tony is famous for, as an exhibitor, he is for the last 17 years been the All England uh, Rose Amateur Rose Champion. And this is what his signature uh, entry looks like. This is a ball of 12 HD, magnificent HD. Now, I Promoting and promoting 
Gemmel's Nado, Flip, Flop, Luros. <laughs> Mabel, what does this have mean? John, <laughs> John's relatives could be, of course, uh, Cardinal Bagnasco. Uh, one wonders. I haven't been able to trace that line. Now, when I come to Christian, our next speaker, I tried to search for Christian's relatives, couldn't come up with any. <laughs> so I have assumed he's an alien from another planet. <laughs> However, he does have a sense of humor when he gives names to roses. In fact, his little miniature uh, coffee bean is codenamed Wheat Doo Doo. <laughs> the name you use to call your mother affectionately. <laughs> However, Christian in his own right has also won a golden rose of Rose Hills with Timo. And our next speaker is Ping Lin. And Ping uh, is quite a distinguished uh, Hybridizer himself, having won some double ARS awards, such as Rainbow Scott Day. Love and peace, we all remember that. But here's the one I think he deserves a round of applause uh, because it's Remember Me, and it was a living tribute, of course, uh, because of those NYPD officers that lost their lives in the 9 in the 11, 11 tra tra tragedy. Now, Ping has a romantic touch in naming roses. Can you get this? Yeah. Kiss me, hot wonder, my girl. And the last one is called Champagne Wishes. So I think he has, when it comes to naming roses, he's a romantic. Now, so here's your camel here to brush my name. We're going to ask him some very, very deliberate questions. And the first one uh, I would like to know is, how do they decide on the names of roses? What propels them to give them some of these exotic names that looks like, uh, shall I say, a shopping guide that you get in the mailbox as unwanted mail? I'm going to give this to Colin first. <laughs> had a system on their denominations and we took a little bit of the name of the female and a little bit of the name of the male and combined them into the denomination. So for instance, uh, home run was Sisbaco, so that was City of San Francisco, Cross of Baby Love, Tarzana. So they're all contained within the Sisbaco. Okay. And then we have some home run relatives now. And there was a cross of Julia Child in Home Run, which became J-U-C-I-H-O-R. Wait, do you see more? It's not going to be introduced, so you don't have to worry about that. Very international, especially Keith Jones in the UK. Very embarrassed about these H-O-R names that are coming into his uh, test field right now. But there is a little bit of system to the madness, not a lot. Uh, what Christian has to add to uh, Tom's works? Well, we pretty much have the same since then, since I have worked for Weeks Rose also. Uh, but uh, just to give another example, is Dream Come True was advertised by Dr. Putchman, so it became Wet Dark Pot. So it was time to, we put the second one of his already into the trial, where it's like, well, we can't. <laughs>
Well, Sam Jones was horrified by his pronunciation. Would you pronounce the word beaches for <laughs> Oregon, beside roses, we have, beside roses, we have beautiful beach. <laughs> Naming roses, 
it's simple if you're naming it after a person. Um, Elsina Dean, a beautiful person, a beautiful rose. But if you're not using a person's name, I think that the name for the rose is actually already there. It's up to us to discover it. And I've had the, uh, the fortune to name some roses for Star, and they had a rose that was um, an improved paradise, they were going to call it. Uh, which, I don't know if it's, if it's one of their better roses, but it was a really nice rose. They decided to introduce it. They said, showed it to me. I, I saw it in the field. I said, wow, that's a great rose. What are you going to call it? They said, well, it's really a better form of paradise, so we're going to call it improved paradise. <laughs> and I said, well, there's probably some worse names if you really think about it. <laughs> And they said, well, what would you call it? I said, well, what about Paradise Found? You know, after Milton's poem. So, so I think that name was just waiting for the rose. And I was able to name a few more for them, like Full Moon Rising, All American Magic, uh, Lunar Mist. And then sometimes it depends what you're trying to do with the rose. If you're trying to come up with names that will sell commercially, um, I originally started breeding polyanthus, and the reason I started to breed polyanthus is because people like Tom Carruth and Keith Zeri were breeding hybrid teas, putting up 300,000 seedlings a year, and literally I was doing a little more than 30 to 40, but you know, 100 to 200. What chances did I have to compete with hybrid teas? And I thought, well, I'll do polyanthus because nobody's doing polyanthus. I found out afterwards nobody was doing it because they didn't sell. <laughs> maybe latch on to this series, so I came up with the Little Rascal series. I thought, well, a series of roses. You know, the first ones I had were Spanky, Darla, and Alfalfa, and later came up with Buckwheat, and, and uh, I figured that might have some commercial value. Um, it turned out to be wrong again. <laughs> uh, and now, well, uh, I'm, I am finished, except I do have to explain the bag lady. Because this was something that really bothered me. I, the rose that Elsina Dean came from the uh, seed parent was uh, Ladybug. And because BAG is the Breeders' Day designation, I didn't even think, and I put Bag Lady, because that reminded me it came from Ladybug. After I registered the rose and showed it to a friend of mine, he said, what are you doing? <laughs> You're calling her a Bag Lady? <laughs> so, of course, I immediately said, uh, email to Elsina and I profusely apologized and she was very gracious about it and said that she didn't care. <laughs> so I'm done with that question. I think John you've exonerated your uh, credibility by explaining how Bag Lady came into being but did that image have anything to do with it? <laughs> Which one? <laughs>
uh, Royal National Law Society Amateur Champions, the previous champion to me was Doc Charlton, an absolutely superb rose exhibitor, par excellence, that guy, without doubt. But he said to me that Sutherland Supreme should be called Ramsbottom Supreme. <laughs> and I asked him the question why. He says, because the darn thing does not grow on our side of the Pennines, but it grows absolutely superb on the Lancashire side of the Pennines. So it grows really well for me, and I think John's had a go at growing the rose at Alice Breaker with little yeah. success. Um, it, it's yeah, a, it's slowly coming along. It's, it's a rose that either likes you or it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> it, it grows really well in our locality, both the Southern Supreme and the Alice Breaker. But the rose I'd really like to talk about, Tom, you're talking about naming roses. You mentioned the Out the Age Rose. Yes. I'll tell you the story behind the LBH rose. I read a, um, a rose, a seedling from, and I have to refer to my notes because it was, a, it was quite some time ago. It was in 19... Yeah, here. Can you hear me? Yeah. It was in 1974, bred from fragrant cloud and mischief. So going back quite some, quite some years. What was unique about this rose was it had an absolutely superb fragrance. We all know fragrant cloud. Mm -hmm. It's probably one of the best fragrant roses in this year. This seedling was equally as good as fragrant cloud, fragrant wise. Colour was a, 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 a paler pink. And this rose was growing in a rose nursery in Nottingham. Um, I'm sure you've, most of you have heard of a rose nursery called Gregory's. Gregory's Roses. It was growing in their nursery. And the LBH charity were having a big publicity to, um, bash that particular year. And they went to Gregory's and dis decided they wanted to have a rose that they could name after their patron. Their patron at the time was Princess Diana. Okay? They picked my seedling. Can you imagine how I felt? Having a rose called Princess Diana. Buckingham Palace wouldn't give permission. Not because of me, or because of Robert Bottom. <laughs> because they would not get permission for any role. Things have changed now. There are royalty roses all over the place now, they're not yet. But they wouldn't get permission. So the charity said, don't worry, we've got a good name for it. We will call it after the charity. LBAs. Well, whilst I agree that the LBAs charity is a superb organisation, it's a kiss of death giving a rose and name of LBH, isn't it? <laughs> and that's a story between LBH. But I was actually invited down to London and I met Princess Diana. She thanked me for the rose. She shook my hand. That's the hand. <laughs> and it's never been for <laughs> situation you've had while pollinating. <laughs> Are we talking roses? <laughs> That's a whole different answer. Most embarrassing while pollinating. I always pollinate fully clothed. <laughs> So that limits it. I'm, I'm going to have to pass and maybe come back. I'm, I'm with you. I can't think of anything worse. Listen in on next Saturday, and I bet you he uses this question in his program. <laughs> <laughs> and you'll have a tale to tell. Tom Carruth, I know you've got embarrassing moments. I do. Searched and searched and found a tag that had just the perfect string on it. They were happy. 
things were moving along. One day we walked into the greenhouse and about 50% of these were on the ground with no strain. And we found out that not only were they very happy about the new strain, the mice in the greenhouse were extremely happy. They had these lovely white nests in May out of the strain. So we had a lot of unknowns that year, which by the way, when you make the denomination, it becomes unk. So, for instance, Dick Clark, is Wick Funk. Wick Funk. <laughs> Fourth of July, unknown. But it wasn't from that year. Okay, I got it. Well, Mr. Bagasco, now has an answer. Let's go over there. <laughs> I, I think this applies to your question. It, probably the most embarrassing thing was I was. Um, I had brought some roses back, or arranged to have them sent back from Italy, from the Fineschi Garden. Uh, we were going to try to save these roses. It was, uh, you know, those of you that know Fineschi know that they had 300 roses in their garden that were the last of their particular variety in the world. So we were going to try to preserve some of those, and I was working with Jackson and Perkins to try to get some of those over here and propagate it. So Keith Zeri, uh, we were going to sell them at the California Coastal Rose Society every November has uh, a rare and unusual rose auction. So Keith had propagated uh, 10 of them and was going to provide them for the auction. So I went up there one fall and uh, toured the uh, grounds in Somas with, uh, with Keith and the greenhouses. And uh, then we went, he said, I've got your roses boxed up for you. So we went into the uh, cooler, he brought out the rose, and the roses, and I thought, wow, these are really heavy for bare root roses, but <laughs> I didn't think anything of it. Put them in the trunk of my car and drove home. About an hour after I'd been home, which is uh, probably a four hour drive from Somas, I got a frantic call from Keith Zeri, and he says, did you happen to look into the box to see what you had? And I said, no, let me go check. And he said, uh, hopefully there's seeds in there. Oh. And it was all Keith's breeding for the following year. Oh. And I said, oh, I said, you know, I thought the box was a little heavy. And I said, I said, um, you know, I can bring it back to you next week. He said, no, why don't you drive north? I'll drive south. <laughs> now, that was before Jackson and Perkins went out of business. <laughs> Christian, maybe. Mm. Yeah, see, what's fun being here, Tommy, is that I could totally change the direction. Because I didn't answer the first question. So now I'm going to answer the first question, and I won't answer that second one. <laughs> <laughs> if you ask the third one, I'll answer the second one. This is true of French Canadians. <laughs> <laughs> so do you think Pink got interpreted so we could understand it? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, but to be honest, uh, I have not been pollinating in the last uh, eight, nine years, so... Uh, uh, well, we have a medication for that. Yes. <laughs> so that's why I'm going to answer the first question about naming, because uh, either Tom or I answered it really properly. Uh, it, it is honestly difficult to come up with the right name for the rose, because a good name will make it sell, and a bad name will kill the market. Yeah. So, you know, after spending 10 years on, from the pollination to the time of introduction, well, you want, to, you want it to be successful. So, you just don't pick up the first name that comes up. You know, you have to really look at different lists and look at names. And, and in fact, actually, in Pomona, where our, our main office is, we have a folder, that tick, with a list of names from years and years and years that have been accumulated. And every time we're lacking inspiration, we just open the file and read names and read names and read names. I could tell you that. There's a lot of good names, but when you want to apply it to a rose, a lot of the time they don't apply. And like, you have a flash. It's almost like a flash. Like Maxine, in the, in the, who worked with us at Weeks for years and years, she, one time she came up, we had a yellow rose. She, we, again, we were going through names and names, and she came with a sparkle and shine. It was like, yes. It was like, creates an emotion. Uh, that was that was just a, uh, that was right from the first time, and at the end, when you don't have a name, there's a really good solution. You go up to Tom, you give him two go two bottles of wine to drink, <laughs> and then he comes up with Ed Tide, all kind of weird names that nobody else would have think of. So that's how we create names. <laughs> And mustard. <laughs> yeah. That was the nickname. Yeah. 
because it's perfectly described that little plate of ketchup and mustard you get at the Chinese restaurant. Sorry, uh, it's not the same color as that rose in its bicolor, and it's not. <laughs> just about, about names, when you know that rose forever as ketchup and mustard. I mean, we sat down and was like, okay, what am I going to name it? It's been named ketchup and mustard for five years already. It was like, where are the names are better? We look at the game of the list, we think about it, nothing. It stayed that way. Well, quite frankly, as a rose color, I was waiting for French fries and onion rings. <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe an open question for some of you to, uh, to answer, but what do you really think of this knockout series? Wait, wait, wait. I have to answer your question about Amber. No, that's answer the late, I late. <laughs> <laughs> if you've ever not... seen the Graham Norton show, they, this guy should be on it. <laughs> I cannot please, I, I, I cannot wait to, to tell the story about how Amber has seen that when when I do in Rose Brady. You know, I have two daughters. And when they get up to 14, 15, they have to come to the greenhouse and help me to do pollination. And that is the place that I get. I don't know how to tell the kid how to make sex. Dr. <laughs> <laughs> Brower. And one day, my daughter asked me, Dad, what is pollination mean? And what is pollination all about? <laughs> that is embarrassing. <laughs> successful. So you just don't pick up the first name that comes up. You know, you have to really look at different lists and look at names. And, and in fact, actually, in Pomona, where our, our main office is, we have a folder, that tick, with a list of names from years and years and years that have been accumulated. And every time we're lacking inspiration, we just open the file and read names and read names and read names. And I could tell you that. There's a lot of good names, but when you want to apply it to a rose, a lot of the time they don't apply. And like, you have a flash, it's almost like a flash. Like Maxine, in the, in the, the, who worked with us at weeks for years and years, she, one time she came up, we had a yellow rose, she, we, again, she were going through names and names, and she came with a sparkle and shine, it was like, yes. It was like, creates an emotion uh, that, was, that was just, a, uh, that was right from the first time. And at the end, when you don't have a name, there's a really good solution. You got the tongue, you give him two, go two bottles of wine to drink, <laughs> and then he comes up with ebb tide, all kind of weird names that nobody else would have think of. So that's how we create names. A <laughs> uh, follow up question. Who came up with ketchup and mustard? <laughs> perfectly described that little plate of ketchup and mustard you get at the Chinese restaurant. Sorry, uh, it's not the same color as that rose in its bicolor, and it's not. Uh, <laughs> sat down and was like, okay, what am I going to name it? It's been named ketchup and mustard for five years already. It was like, where are the names are better? We look at the game of the list, we think about it, nothing. It stayed that way. Well, quite frankly, as a rose color, I was waiting for French fries and onion rings. <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe an open question for some of you to, uh, to answer, but what do you really think of this knockout series? Wait, wait, wait. I have to answer your question about Amber. No, that's answer the late, I late. If you've ever seen the Graham Norton show, they, this guy should be on it. <laughs> I cannot please, I, I, I cannot wait to, to tell the story about how Amber has seen that when, when I do in Rose Reading. You know, I have two daughters. 
And when they get up to 14, 15, they have to come to the greenhouse and help me to do pollination. And that is the place that I get. I don't know how to tell the kid how to make sex. <laughs> <laughs> And one day, my daughter asked me, Dad, what is pollination mean? And what is pollination all about? <laughs> that is embarrassing. Only <laughs> 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 the answer. You know, as an audience, you took a long while to warm up to this. <laughs> but now you're in tune. <laughs> revolution that it has created with landscapers. But I want to ask these gentlemen, what is the impact of getting landscape roses that look like shrubs? Are we getting away from hybrid teas, etc.? Start with Cody. Well, I've got a big question for him there. <laughs> Bill Rattler's not here, is he? <laughs> You're safe, John. Uh, first of all, I, I really admire what Bill did in producing a rose like that and the goals that he was after, uh, you know, for somebody to, we were talking about this earlier, to breed roses under lights in a Milwaukee basement for 20 years to come up with that. I admire his achievement. However, I, I don't even consider those roses. I consider them flowering shrubs. And if they're used as a flowering shrub, they have a place in the landscape. But I don't think that they should take the focus away, or the American Rose Societies, in our focus away from promoting what roses actually are. The, what Ping was talking about today in his speech about the emotion that roses evoke, that same emotion to me does not come across when you're looking at a bed of you know, 500 knockouts. You see color, and that's about it. But the emotion that belongs to a rose and the history of the rose and the people who spent their lives producing those type of roses, um, I think can get lost if the industry continues to promote landscape roses. And we were talking to somebody today that apparently the industry is now asking again for hybrid teas, that they're tired of knockouts. And um, I, I think those roses have a place in the landscape, but I think we need to to stick with some traditional ideas about roses and also go forward in the direction that the, the forefathers of roses gave us. John is not running for any public <laughs> However, it is spectacle. You've got a fan in the front row, John. <laughs> Give, give, him, give him the number. Uh, but in all honesty, I think the knockout revolution, if we call it that, has spun people like Tom Perth to do uh, home run and pink home run, which I believe are far better than knockout Tom. And they grow in beds a lot better than knockout. So there is, in fact, a ramification there of improvement. Now, on the UK side, there has not been this kind of revolution. In fact, what's happened in the UK is the number of rose breeders is declining, and the number of new introductions is, is declining. But if you're an eagle eye and you look at the American rose new introductions, there's a company called the World of Roses, who will name a rose, register it, give you five or 10 plants, and charge you 2,000 pounds. What's your feeling on that? Company? And I think he's dead alive over it, as you say, I think he should. And you think it should only be 20 pounds. <laughs> Where do these roses come from? That's the first question. I mean, it, it, they seem to be able to produce the most plants. You know, if you've, got a, if you've got a name and you're quite prepared to pay that amount of money, they'll find you a rose. Exactly. Where does it come from? I don't know. And what kind of quality are we talking about? Exactly. I mean, I mean, I could, I could produce, uh, if I wanted to, I could produce a hundred or so roses per annum. I could only do 30 or Okay. <laughs> I could do a hundred roses per annum. Um, how many of those would be good? Good point. Oh, they could. Under dreams right now, 
But I, I think there's also a, a room for preserving the past, and that's what I'm concerned about, I, is I don't want these genetics to disappear from the face of the earth. A lot of breeders spent their entire lives, maybe they didn't die like the plant hunters did at the turn of the last century to bring us new plants, but you've got people like Pedro Dodd in Spain whose roses never got wide distribution here in the U.S. or um, Le Grice out of uh, England who some of his roses are here, but some of them are, have somewhat disappeared. Uh, and then even the early American breeders, uh, the early J&P roses are beginning to disappear. Some of, of Ollie Weeks' roses and Herb Swim's roses are hard to find. And while we're, we might like exhibiting roses and we, we might grow a garden that has uh, 100 roses, you know, 96 of them could be for exhibition. Why not grow four that are rare cultivars that uh, no one's growing anymore? Maybe preserve those for future generations. I think the future of the rules is safe. I think people like Tom, Gareth Fry, Colin Dixon, they're all concentrating on healthy, and they're producing healthy roses. Go back to the 60s. The object was to produce novelty of colour at the expense of health. I think we've gone down that road now and we realise that was a mistake. And as I said, people like Tom, these people are named, they're producing healthy roses. Your roses are some of the healthiest, certainly around in the UK. Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, this one, we, we call it absolutely fabulous, so what is it called here? Julia Child. Julia Child. That's an absolutely yeah. wonderful thing. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the right direction to go. We've got to look at the health thing, and that is very, very important. And people want to just plant roses in the garden, low maintenance, forget all about them, and this kind of rose that people such as Tom are producing is what they want, and that's what's going to happen. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Tom, we should tell you that uh, Julia Child, although it did get the new name absolutely fabulous in the UK, we understand it grows very well and you pour two bottles of champagne <laughs> over the night. And a pound of butter. You may not see it yet, but we're right at the precipice of, I think, a whole new type of rose coming forward are clean roses that look like roses. They are no longer the flowering shrubs that John has spoken of. Uh, Mayon is at that forefront, Cornus is at that forefront, King is at that forefront, with some very fine looking flowers. In my new position as curator of the Huntington Botanic Gardens, it's been very interesting to watch the reception of roses by the public coming through, especially families. <clears throat> they love roses. They adore roses, they stop, they smell, it's the sensory, the visual experience of roses. And it's wonderful to watch that. And you put them before some of these flowering shrubs and the constant comment is, that's a rose. <laughs> you know, they don't think of single petal roses as roses, let alone the shrubby types. But if we can give them a clean, free flowering rose that looks like the rose they're using, then that's where I think we will break forward in our hobby, and we go right at that. Okay. Well, since it's the last question, I have to answer the previous one. <laughs> so, to answer the previous one about knockout, <laughs> well, it's actually part of the final conclusion anyway. Uh, just, came, just came back. Good, good, me. <laughs> Just came back from sales meeting last week, and pretty much uh, what a John Bynasco mentioned, the hybrid tea flooring and grainy sales are up. Our, I was surprised to hear we have seven salesmen on the road, and Tom, I didn't get time to share that with you, sorry, but it's very rare that you have all the group of sales force around the table that agree, they say, Christian, we want more hybrid tea flooring rindy right now. That's the demand because the knockout, is, there's two problems. Rosette, a lot of rosette in the southeast, and the disease has been linked with knockout because it's planted everywhere. Not because it's really a knockout disease, but because it's planted everywhere. So who gets rosette first? Knockout. So people say knockout, rosette, out. So, <laughs> Yeah, that's what I get from the sales rep. They, they get that message that they, the 
knock our sales is really going down quickly, and they want more hybrid teas and, and grannies and flory. But what knockout did is really open doors for nursery like us to sell product. We went into market that we were not in before, like a shrub type of market, and we have established licensees for home run and peak home run with nursery that we will never have established before licensees because they were not growing hybrid teas and flory and stuff like that. But now we could, uh, because of knockout and home run, we get, uh, actually we are able to distribute more roses on the market, but to answer that about the same, uh, about the same answer at Tom, in when we will be able to combine the flower form of hybrid tea with the disease resistance of knockout or home run, then we'll be in business again. But, uh, but I, I'm happy to see the bud hybrid teas and are coming back. All right, thank you. Now, I think you will agree, ladies and gentlemen, that you're seeing history as it evolves as regards rose breeding with these five fine gentlemen. So please show your appreciation by our own applause.
Love you.